Okay. <clears throat> ah, where did we got to? Uh, right. So we were starting to look at um, the uh, creation of our virtual machines for uh, for our infrastructure for our uh, uh, development and test environment. Now we've got one at the moment. Uh, uh, we've got one at the moment and it's being started with this server bootstrap script. Okay, and the server bootstrap script is is very simple because uh, all it does is um, install salt basically. <clears throat> now the difference between what we want on the salt master and what we want on uh, the the other server, which is going to act as our sort of router and network services provider. Um, what we want to different is we we only want to install the minion on the second server. Well, otherwise it's it's pretty similar. Okay, uh, we don't want to install the master. We don't want to install the cloud services stuff. <clears throat> we just want to install um, uh, the minion, and we want that minion to connect back to the salt master, which is. Uh, uh, this is where things start to get tricky. <clears throat> the second server uh, will actually end up being our DHCP server on the local network, which is cool. Uh, the problem is that if we don't have a DHCP server on the local area network, at the point when we create this first server, how does the first server acquire its IP address? Uh, the answer, the short answer is, <clears throat> uh, it will be uh, assigned as a as default um, IP address. Uh, I think by default, VirtualBox will give it a, I mean, VirtualBox will give it its own uh, internal IP addresses on the Sort of with a management network. Um, what we're interested in here is uh, what IP address will we give it when we're dealing with it. Um, and the problem is that, that without the DHCP server, it's going to be assigned uh, a fallback IP address. Which I think by default will be the in the 172 range which is a class uh, is it a class B or a class C I can never remember anyway the, the long and short of it is we don't want to do that because we don't want a default address anyway because it makes it more complicated when we come to then connect the second server to the first one so these two servers uh, will be special cases on our network. Uh, the second server is going to be a special case anyway, uh, to the extent that even when we've got DHCP set up, we would want it to always have a fixed address. Uh, and the reason we want it to have a fixed address is because it will end up being uh, the machine to which we, uh, uh, the, the machine that we request, uh, for example, all our network connections from. Uh, in other words, we need to be able to specify as our uh, gateway machine on the LAN. So, what we will do is we will give it uh, a dot two five four address, which is uh, the highest uh, IP address in whatever range we establish, uh, and we will give server one. It, it really doesn't matter, but we'll give it another fixed IP address in in the same subnet uh, and by making those two 
servers, fixed IP addresses, uh, we can then bootstrap the rest of the system around those two. And from then on, we can use DHCP to actually assign any, any other static addresses we want um, by using the MAC address of network interface cards, uh, we can get the DHCP server to always assign a particular IP address to a particular device, <coughs> uh, to a particular interface actually. Uh, but for these two, we are going to create uh, our internal network and we're going to give them particular IP addresses. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is create the second machine and, um, uh, well, uh, no, let's, let's, let's do this in, in a sensible order. So the first thing I want to do is create uh, the interface on this first machine. Okay, uh, so we are <coughs> setting our box up. Uh, and this is the point at which I can't remember uh, the specific syntax. So All right. So so VM. <coughs> network uh, we want the private network uh, now this is where uh, we want it to be uh, a static IP address okay so we give it a specific IP address Uh, now there's another thing that we need to take into account and that is uh, on the VM box okay uh, we want to set this virtual box in net okay to make sure it's all on an internal network Right, uh, so we want to specify um, virtual box double underscore internal network. Now <clears throat> we can either set this to true uh, just to make it, a, uh, or we can give it a specific name. So, okay, now we go into pros and cons. If we give it a specific name, then if we wanted to run up more than one of these. Uh, systems we would need to make that some kind of parameter um, which we're going to do anyway when we come to naming these machines on our uh, yeah so this is yeah let's call it uh, let's call it um, ooh, central net all right we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute Okay, because there's also uh, how these things are organized on our virtual box network as well. Because <clears throat> you've got to remember that these, these VMs are being registered back with uh, uh, virtual box. Okay, uh, so what IP address should you give it? Now, my internal network. Um, uh, my LAN is 192.168.1 subnet. So I can actually tell this to be a 192.168.1. Uh, now, you've got to be a bit careful. Uh, oh, this is server 1, isn't it? Uh, so let's call it uh, to 
let's call it two five three. Uh, now I happen to know that on my network one dot one uh, is the IP address of um, a managed switch. Two five three. It will be the one below 254, which is the IP address of the uh, second server. Now, um, okay, so things can get a bit, uh, a little bit sticky here, okay. At the moment, what I'm doing. <coughs> is I'm creating a, a 1.254, sorry, 253, within the v, uh, virtual box's private network. In other words, it will keep it quite separate from the bridge network, which connects me out to, for example, the internet. Uh, and that's pretty much what we want to do. What you have to be careful of is when we come to define the router, 192.168.1.254, uh, you have to be careful because uh, at the moment uh, the root uh, let's see um, you, you just have to be careful because what you're doing is you're specifying an IP address which is the same as the IP address uh, would be for the real server on your real network which is great, but you can get yourself in a real buggers model if you're not careful with everything on your system, because uh, you can end up addressing the wrong the wrong machine. So what you could do is you could actually specify these as complete different network ranges, uh, but then in your configuration you have to be very careful uh, about making sure that you account for the differences, because what you really want to do. Um, uh, uh, right, so you can see that the root here uh, takes everything out through this uh, 10 to subnet. Uh, so it goes out through 22, which is the default root through the virtual box uh, network system. And uh, yeah, so if, if we if we if we are going out to the internet, we will go via this 1022, uh, which is the gateway from the internal virtual box environment out to wherever whatever host virtual box is on. Uh, the point being that even now I can do ping one nine two one six one six eight dot one dot two five four. And you see, I'm getting a response, even though I haven't defined uh, 1.254 yet. Okay, uh, and if I do look at the IP address, okay, you can see the IP address of this machine is 10.215. Uh, okay, so this machine is on the 10.0.2 subnet. And you'll find that uh, you know all machines uh, will, will be on that 10.2 subnet. It's just the way VirtualBox works. Uh, the point being, this 192, uh, 168.1.254 is on my actual uh, private network. So what I would have to do is when we're when we're configuring this, we have to make sure we shut the door uh, on the uh, outgoing interface so that no traffic can actually go that way if it's addressed to um, well it, it shouldn't be going that way at all it shouldn't be going uh, the only the only machine that should route things through the 1022 interface uh, is the routing machine everything else should route through the routing machine okay in order to properly simulate what we've got in our real system uh, so, uh, this is going to get very confused, isn't it? So, what you've got is, uh, okay, so we've got um, 
Uh, how do I draw this? Okay, so this is virtual box. Okay. Uh, and it's got its own internal network. Okay, so when we create a virtual machine within VirtualBox, uh, it will create an interface. Okay, so this is our network interface. Okay, and this interface uh, is has got the address 10, uh, 0, 2, 15. Okay. And all the traffic on the default route goes through to the standard VBOX interface, which is on 10.022. And this acts as the gateway router, okay, from the internal VBOX environment out to, in this case, the LAN, okay, which is which is running. Uh, yeah. So when so when I when I ping uh, the two five four, it's going through this route, out through this router, and onto the LAN. Okay, and it's just it, this is just a simple uh, bridge interface to the host network, i.e., this LAN. So all packets will simply pass through that 10.2.2 and get routed out onto the LAN, uh, and from there they will just obey whatever the routing on the LAN is. Well, in actual fact, on the host machine on which the VBox is running, okay, so this is the host. Uh, if I look at the host machine, which is this one here, okay. Uh, I can do uh, 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 I can do root uh, ah, uh, hang on a minute, I'm on uh, yeah, I'm on back OS on my <laughs> okay uh, oh bugger um, what is it uh, that's the net stat flags mock. Uh, mm, 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 mm. Uh, uh. Oh, come on. Not helping. Uh, root. Uh, at least. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, that's not really what I want, though, is it? I do. I do want the root. Uh, how the hell do I check the root? root? So the one we're looking for is this, finally. Uh, so this route here uh, is the default route. So any packets that come from uh, VirtualBox uh, out through here are going to be routed via the default route out to this one nine two one six eight. Uh, one nine two one six eight dot one dot two five four. Okay, uh, and in actual fact, that is an existing router which then 
goes out to internet -y type stuff right so uh, the point being that if we if we then create a VM down here with an IT IP address 192.168.1.254 okay we shut this off for all but the SSH needed for us to interact with it and we route everything normally so in other words we replicate the routing on the host on this VM so it goes through here and then this okay gets routed through uh, the virtual box route yeah Ooh, that was as clear as mud wasn't it it'll it, it'll become obvious once we once we start playing with this um, uh, in fact I can probably illustrate this um, if I go on here um, now I can't remember whether it's on okay right good okay so you can see the route yeah so it's going from from this host it's going through the 1022 default uh, gateway okay which is the one we saw up here uh, okay uh, from there it's going to the name server on my local area network which we are about to set up in our virtual environment at 1.254 uh, from there it's going out to 192.168.0.1 which is the um, uh, modem router uh, for my ISP you know that my ISP supplied from there it goes out through my Virgin Media account uh, to all sorts of uh, 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 you know, uh, on their internal network and finally arrives at 172.253 blah 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 uh, uh, at Google <clears throat> all right so that's that, that's what we're doing <clears throat> what we're trying to set up is it will actually look uh, somewhat more difficult <laughs> uh, because it's going to go to to uh, instead of going straight out to this 2.2 .2, it will go first to 192.168.1.254 on our internal private network then it will go out through 10.2.2 because the router will still go out through that default path okay then it will go to the name server on the local area network and the route will continue normally Make your noodle on it right so to that end uh, what we're doing here uh, on this line is we're setting up um, our private network and we're saying that this machine that we're setting up should have an IP address of 1968.1.253 but it's only on the VirtualBox internal internet uh, okay so it should never appear on our LAN uh, and any devices that we specify uh, on this VirtualBox internal network with the name CentralNet will all appear on the same local area network so if we wanted to design a second machine okay we're going to have to uh, make some changes to this but let's let's set this up first now then i'm going to completely destroy and rebuild uh, our virtual machine
and I hope is uh, that when I when I'm developing the real course, because this this is all jumping around all over the place at the moment, because I'm I'm, <clears throat> I'm more focused on a, a particular feature, i.e., getting us started building these virtual machines. Um, but in the course, I think what I'm going to do is each time we come across a new technology, like for example packet switching networks. Uh, there'll be a branch somehow where if you don't understand packet switching networks you'll be able to see a complete course on uh, how they work um, how to configure them and so on uh, so all of this the, the word salad uh, about you know uh, uh, gateway routers and routing and uh, IP addresses and different local area networks and all that kind of stuff although it's confusing uh, at the moment hopefully uh, will be clarified on that you know uh, networking stream so at the end although i i, I don't I'm, I'm probably not going to do a lot of um, streams on me actually writing the course itself uh, the reason being that it's really dull as dishwater to watch somebody writing scripts and stuff. Uh, I mean, to be honest, I'm not even sure how exciting this is. Uh, at least this way you can see you know, the, the, the cock-ups and mistakes and what I have to look up and things like that. Uh, so you can uh, get a feel for uh, you know, the, uh, the sort of process of trying to figure things out. Uh, which I think is <clears throat> the primary value of these uh, streams. Uh, how are we doing? Do, 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 do. Hurry up and wait time again. Okay, well, while we're doing that, uh, I'm going to just jump across this other panel. Now, I, I do somewhere, uh, somewhere, uh, I had put. Uh, documents, workspace, uh, it might be in here actually. Now, did I? Looks like a possible. Uh, <clears throat> this is just a. a it, this was another project that I played around with for a while, uh, but you can see it, it adds a whole load of parameterization in, and uh, because it's already set up with things like this to install the salt minion. Uh, I might very well uh, just rip some of this off. Uh, directly into uh, the system we're looking at. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Uh, you can see here that um, it, on on this uh, on this one, okay, you can see it it's in, installing uh, the persistent IP tables and then the most basic IP tables <coughs> straight into the virtual machine. Uh, now, what this does uh, is uh, it first uh, 
Uh, let me see. It first sets the policies to be uh, promiscuous, flushes the tables, and then uh, it puts in a couple of rules uh, in order to allow 22 in, so th which is the SSH port, which is necessary for Vagrant to, to work at all. Uh, and then uh, you can see here it's creating the management server. Uh, careful. Um, Uh, yeah, that's allowing salt. Uh, yeah, so th uh, this script takes a slightly different approach. Um, And you can see, uh, okay, so that was the that was the management server, uh, which has got quite a lot going on in it. Um, this is a list of all the supplementary machines, which were in this network. So you can see there are two name servers. Uh, oh my! Uh, then you've got. Uh, Uh, I think they were console servers. Those those three are console servers. Uh, then you've got a database server, a couple of web servers, another database server, uh, a second server on the management network, a third server on the management network, uh, then uh, a server for GitLab, uh, and then a couple of build servers, <laughs> and a backup server. So it was, it was a fairly big network of machines. Uh, and then it was a loop over that in order to create all the various bits and bobs. Yeah. Yes. Yes, there's yeah, a lot going on. But the, I mean, the main thing we're going to steal uh, is uh, these ideas. The assault bootstrap version. Uh, which we'll use, and also getting this salt minion in. But we're going to do it all in a slightly different way, I think. Uh, which I think, in the end, is probably cleaner than the way we've got it here. <coughs> uh, right, uh, anyway, uh, so what have we got now? Uh, let's go and look at our... Uh, no, no, no. So everything seems to work the same way, except now we've now got this extra adapter, Ethernet 1, right, which has got our 192.168.253 address. So you'll see we've still got the this one, okay, and if we look at the root, uh, it will still be by default going out through the... Uh, uh, Gauge brain. Uh, it's still going out via 1022, uh, but we've now got an extra uh, network interface card. Um, all right, so now because we've got uh, our address is 153, basically anything on 192.168.1 subnet. Uh, we'll hit that interface first. Uh, but we're gonna we're gonna tighten everything up. 
because we want that to be the default route really because we again this says anything on that subnet will be first directed out through that ethernet one which is great uh, but we also want to change the default route because we want any traffic going to for example the internet to go through 192.168.1254 which will be our router at the moment anything which is not in one of these specialized rules will go out through the 10.0.2.2 link uh, in other words ethernet zero uh, and straight out as we explained before going out via the virtual box which is not what we want so uh, anyway uh, long story short we've got what we want to uh, get rid of that machine again Right, uh, if we go uh, Okay, it's probably worth pointing this out uh, Right You'll notice that all of these configuration elements start at the moment at, at the top here. They start config.vm, uh, and in the Vagrant file, uh, that refers to the sort of top level. Um, so all of these things here apply to all of the subsequent machines. So they will all do this jiggery puggery here to prevent the error out, uh, error being output don't think we need that anymore uh, they will all get this provisioning shell that will be executed uh, which will in install the basic ip tables and the basic rule to allow uh, ssh uh, but then we say okay here's a vm we're going to define management 01 okay so everything in here Okay, which is addressed by management 01 rather than config. Uh, it only applies to the management 01 machine. So you can see the host name is very specific. Uh, uh, we've we've expanded the number of CPUs. I think I can't remember what was what. Okay, it's got its own IP network. And here we've explicitly specified that it's adapter three. Uh, we'll, we will do that as well. Uh, uh, in ours, uh, the reason being that we we want to be very specific, Ooh, and that brings us to another another thing about setting things up. Um, when you have a choice between default behavior and being explicit, it's often. Uh, it will serve you better to be explicit rather than using defaults okay so in this case sure we could have let the adapter go uh, it, it will it will be adapter 3 anyway because adapter 1 is the local loop adapter 2 will always be ethernet 0 which is used uh, those two are used by um, VirtualBox and adapter 3 uh, is, is very specifically going to be our Ethernet 1, which will be our uh, private network. Uh, similarly here, you can see I've, I've sort of taken the default here, uh, and I've just set VirtualBox Internet be true. So in this case, uh, not following my own counsel, uh, and I've just accepted the default. Uh, so there's that. The other problem with this, as we will discover as we go on, is that by defining uh, the machine names uh, to be uh, specific names, uh, you can run into difficulties if you want to run more than one version of this system. So you want to have the vagrant file, uh, do a vagrant up, then have another directory somewhere else and do a vagrant up on that. You, you'll end up with lots of collisions in VirtualBox, for example, you'll end up with collisions on the machine names. 
now that appear in the library. You have to be able to specify a prefix of some sort, like a group identifier or just a prefix to the name, to differentiate between those different virtual machines. You'll see what I mean in a minute. Um, uh, so again, th this rule uh, is specific to the management network. Uh, uh, this one, what are we doing? Um, Okay, this is setting up some special magic uh, because during development we actually map these synchronized folders to specific locations in order that uh, we can have the uh, top files, uh, the state files, the pillar files, the reactor files and the public key files uh, safely mapped away um, then we got uh, sort of configuration is being mapped in so this is all to do with the fact that uh, this was de designed as a, uh, a development environment for this particular project uh, like I said we're going to steal some of this uh, this was a patch Uh, for the stack pi uh, that has now been fixed I believe in in the actual main line so we don't need to use that uh, this was somewhat of a long winded way uh, I mean I wrote, I wrote this a long long time ago uh, this was a way of getting the uh, Salt master installed and started. Uh, so you can see it, it did the it did, did a very simple way of accepting the key. Then uh, it would stop the salt master, apply the patch, <coughs> uh, stop all the salt masters, restart the salt master in order that the patch could be applied, uh, and only then. Uh, yeah, uh, it ended, but it would apply the the state. Again, we'll get onto that. Ooh. Okay, management VM shell run always. Yeah, uh, attempt to restart the salt master again. A lot of this was dealing with just issues. But you can see all of these machines are being created on the same virtual box uh, network. Uh, okay, uh, what, what was I doing? Oh yeah, I'm going to create the second machine. Right. If I do, let's just have a look at me. Right, so the server bootstrap at the moment uh, is all obviously geared around uh, server one. What I really want to do is I want to have all of the things like uh, like here. Okay, we've got the, the fully qualified domain name uh, from which we can then extract the host name, and I believe. Uh, although I think the host name and the machine name were taken to be the same. Uh, oh, here we go. So you can see here, okay, we, we take uh, uh, the host name. Oh, in this case, the, the host name was just taken to be the fully qualified domain name. Yeah. I mean, Sure, why not? Uh. <clears throat> uh. 
So we're going to just use name actually, uh, which is exactly what we use up here. Uh, so basically, we can get some of these values uh, passed in. Yeah, so we can get all, all, all of these, all of these names, all of this stuff we can get passed in. Uh, which means we can preserve most of this. Uh, the only thing that will be different is we won't have these two flags on anything other than uh, the, menu, uh, the master. So we can have additional flags passed in as well. There's no point in doing this anywhere other than the master, but we need to do it on the master every time a new minion becomes available. Interesting. Okay, so we may... Yeah, we want to change the way that works. We separate that out to a separate thing. Uh, and in fact, I think, uh, okay, so the issue is this. Um, okay, so we've got, effectively, we've got two machines. Okay, we've got server. What? Uh, I mean, this is at the moment. We might end up with more in the long run, but we've got server two. Right? Uh, now, this one, we run a master. And a minion. And on this one, we're just running a minion. All right? So we create this this machine first, uh, and it creates the master, and it creates the minion, and then uh, this part of a script script uh, is running on the master, and it's just waiting for uh, uh, for for this minion uh, to submit its key and when it finds it it accepts it which is exactly what we want it to do in order to get this one running now vagrant then brings up let's say it brings up box two okay and it starts running the minion and this minion will connect back to the master and submit its key what we then need to do is we need to recontact this master Okay, and have it effectively yeah, do this part of the script again uh, and accept the minion ID for the second machine. So this is a sort of rudimentary um, orchestration problem. And I'm not entirely sure what what the easiest way of doing that will be. Hmm. 
could do is I could create a master last oh the minions will time out eventually but generally speaking they'll keep retrying to contact the master and certainly in the time we're talking about uh, so the, the, the minions would be installed they would try to contact the master the master won't be there And then we create the master and pass it a list of all the minion keys we're expecting and modify this bit of code so that it accepts all of the minion keys for our environment or indeed we, we could be lazy and just accept any minion key that's submitted on the basis that uh, it's all working on the internal network anyway so uh, as in on the virtual box network uh, Because I'm not entirely sure that we'd be it would be easy to orchestrate uh, Because the, 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 the shells are, uh, each, each of these um, uh, each of these uh, shell commands is actually run in uh, a, a lexical order and in a scope order so they're not run necessarily in the order that you would look at them here and think oh, yeah that's the order in which they run uh, it's possible you know so if we for example were to somewhere in here run the management 01 provisioning script a you know, shell command it wouldn't necessarily be run when this was encountered it, it would be run during the definition of the vm and so it'd be it, it it just wouldn't work uh what i can do is i can use ssh directly so i can run ah, ah, that might be a way of doing it I mean, it's a bit yank, janky because, okay, so what I'm thinking is, uh, what I'm thinking is, until until all the firewalls are set up uh, on this internal network, okay, when this, when this machine's configured and the minion's up and running, there's no reason I can't SSH back to the master, okay, and then run. Uh, this little acceptance, you know, this, this series of acceptance commands uh, on, on the master. So that would be a way of doing it. It's a bit janky because that's not, uh, you, you know, it, it relies on effectively a shortcoming of, the, of this bootstrap process because it relies on the internal network's SSH port staying open and we are going to shut those uh, the only the only ports that will be open between these two machines uh, 
uh, going that way into the master. You know, so the master won't allow anybody uh, other than a minion to connect it to it. Uh, we'll be able to SSH the other way though. Uh, but we won't be able to SSH into the master. The master has to be protected more than most because, of course, it's got everything on it. Uh, having said that, there will be some raft protocol allowed. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Okay, enough talk. Let's do some experimenting. Um, so the first thing I want to do is make this server uh, bootstrap more parameterized and make the call uh, from the vagrant file. Uh, Mm. Right, so I want to let's change things so okay let's do it a step at a time right okay so the first thing I want to do is make each of these uh, something Mm. Right, for the most part, the host name is going to be the machine name. Okay, but we'll let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. Uh, config VM provision shell path, blah blah blah. Uh, okay, I'm going to guess that I can just say args uh, and then uh, don't guess. Uh, right, so uh, provisioning shell. We can specify path and then we can specify args uh, to pass the shell script when executing it as a single string. Uh, Uh, okay, so let's. Uh, okay, so let's uh, pass the args, and it's going to be an array. Okay, let's let's just try this. So on. Uh, Um, um, okay, uh, and that's those two bits. What else do we need? Nothing for the time. Oh, uh, oh, we're also going to pass uh, additional arguments. So minus L minus M. Right. So. Uh, so now uh, I'm not going to provide any default. It's going to be dollar one. Again, we'll probably have to uh, make this a bit more robust. Dollar uh, two. Uh, that stays the same. Um, we do bootstrap. Oops. Now this one uh, we will do uh, additional additional 
bootstrap. And we do actually want this to expand into multiple things. Uh, so we may, uh, we're, we're probably going to end up having to uh, oops. This we want dollar three, but we also want to make sure that uh, if dollar three isn't defined, right? So um, uh, If the parameter is onset or null, the expansion of word is substituted. Mm. Uh, well, I suppose that means we want uh, two or three. Come on, dash, please, because you want it to be nothing. I guess. That's a reasonable. Uh, we've got everything now, haven't we? Give it a go. Let's see what happens. It's probably worth pointing out that although vagrant file uh, definitions are Ruby files, I'm not a Ruby program. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm constantly looking up, you know, how to do things in Ruby. Uh, uh, so everything on the left uh, was done by creative Google searches. Uh, well, I say everything to a large extent. Um, when I was trying to set up that particular environment, uh, mind you, that was oh, how long ago was that? Uh, I'm not even sure. Uh, where are we? When's the last time I did that? Yeah, there you go. 21st of April 2017. Uh, so that gives you some idea of how long it's been since I've done this in anger. Because uh, I think that that was the last major project. Most of the other stuff I do with Vagrant is sort of knocking up a box to play with. Uh, that's the last time I did a complicated 
Um, right, so somebody outside. Uh, a complicated multi machine setup with Vagrant. Oh, I really need to sort that out. Uh, having said that, is that not. Hmm, that might be actually inside uh, the bootstrap script. I could actually fix it by using alias to go alias after app get, but life's too short. This little fellow is exhausted because he was out this morning running about. He managed to escape from my garden for an hour. Yeah, you a bloody menace. Uh, I was warned that uh, Jack Russell's could tunnel. And uh, <laughs> this morning, Kenny decided to demonstrate that ability. Fortunately, he's got a tracker on his collar. Uh, uh, he took about an hour to figure out which gardens he was running around in. Fortunately, my neighbours were very understanding and let me go and investigate. And wouldn't you know it, by the time I'd actually figured out where he was and where he was going, he'd sort of done a big loop and I found him in my next door's garden. So he'd gone out of one next door neighbour's garden, gone in a big loop around the neighbourhood and basically come home. And, uh, yeah. It was a bit stressful, worrying about the little fella, but he, he found his way home, didn't you? Although I think you were a bit worried as well by the time you'd uh, had your hour. Mm -hmm. Never mind. <laughs> Get a dog, they said. Very relaxing. Good boy most of the time, yeah. Right, how are we getting on? Uh, so salt's been installed. And it seems to have done it with Python 3, so... But the good news is it hasn't choked on anything. Uh, the question is, has it set the host name and the fully fully qualified domain name? And it's just somebody outside of the <coughs> car. Oh, there you go. Get that. There you go. There you go. Okay. Uh, it's probably worth looking at. Uh, let's just do. Uh, oops. But. Uh, Right, so over here, in amongst all the other garbage, okay, so that's the machine that we're running on. You see it's called central underscore default. Uh, okay, now we're gonna we're gonna change that name. But you can see it's got the two network adapters, uh, whereas normally it would only have the one. And this is on the internal network. Uh, yeah. Uh, central net. Uh, we're going to extend that and we're going to give it a more subtle name. Right. Uh, back to. Uh, let's see what we've got. Vagrant SSH. Now, hopefully. Uh, yep, looks like our host name's been set correctly. Oh, oh, oh. 
What's the name? Where's name? Uh, FQ QDN. Right, so we've got that correct, which means that the minion host name should be. Let's set the salt. Check that by sudo salt key minus L. Should list our accepted keys, and there it is. Okay, so everything seems to be working now that we've made that little change. Uh, so that. Uh, uh, the other thing is, it seems to also it's installed the salt master because that's what the salt key would. The you answer know, if the master wasn't installed, uh, the salt key wouldn't have appeared uh, in there. So we appear to be good to go. Uh, now what we're going to do is solve the uh, the problem of okay, what do you do about the alternate servers? To that extent. Uh, or everything from everything uh, what that it applies to every server that applies to every server uh, that applies to every server uh, although we'll come up with a better way once we've got a name server but on these two servers again during the bootstrap process there is no name server so we have to explicitly set that uh, that will be applicable, that will be applicable, and that will be applicable. So everything down to here is applicable for server 1 and server 2. Right? This, however, should only ever run on the master. Uh, and in actual fact, it, it really only needs to run... Uh, the, the good thing about this, okay, is that the, that it, a it's explicit okay so it only accepts a, a very specific minion id and the second thing is it's good because it um uh it, it checks for the minion key in a way that doesn't rely on uh the salt master in any way it, uh, other than looking at the directory structure so uh, it's slightly better than simply running the salt key minus Y A uh, or, or a minus capital A, which would accept all of the keys. So this is slightly better than doing that. Um, to that extent, I quite like the idea of having this as a separate script uh, that we call against the master. It's still, uh, uh, it's, it's, yeah, and then when we're setting up server two, only during the bootstrap process, yeah, we would uh, do an SSH back to the master to set this up. Now, how does that apply when we are doing this on a real system? Well, we would probably first of all run this script into the master that will work fine it will work exactly as it does in this okay so we will just uh, we would log on to the master run this script give it the same parameters everything will work fine when we go to server 2 we've installed the base debian and we want to run this bootstrap script so we run the server bootstrap script that would install salt get that all up and running okay uh, but we wouldn't then immediately run this acceptance script here. We would either log back onto the main server and rerun it on the master, or from the minion, we would SSH this script back. All right. So. Uh, now, funnily enough, we 
could do this. No, no, no. Okay, so SSH remote script. Uh, uh, so you can see here, okay, that's how we would effectively do it. Um, and that would be permitted because the files at the top, at the initial construction of these machines, the file rule, rule, rules would allow that. Okay, and if we every subsequent machine would do that, but it would mean leaving the master SSH open, uh, which on the local area network we're going to do that anyway. But to be fair, because that's the way I'm going to log into the machine. The difference is uh, how the private key is going to be distributed. Yes. Okay. So that's how we do it. So the so the very first thing we need to do. Okay. So when we when we deploy onto the master. We're going to want to do the configuration of the master before we then go on to build server 2. At least we want to do the sort of preliminary configuration. The preliminary configuration should, uh, amongst other things, uh, deploy uh, the keys for SSH. Okay, so we would have a special bootstrap account key yeah if we have a special bootstrap account okay that we create on the master do we really need to go to all that trouble because once these two machines are set up we've got the main server and we've got the router Okay, when we create a new machine, the only thing we really want to do is install salt on it because you'll then come back to the master anyway, and that's where you'll drive the configuration, the actual configuration of the machine beyond. I mean, it's, it's actually true of the router as well. Right, it depends how much we're desperate to automate this process. And since Vagrant doesn't have any uh, sort of orchestration capability directly, I'm thinking, I'm thinking we're probably making a amount of lava more we aware. Once the minion's running on the second machine uh, so once you've run up vagrant the very first thing you will want to do is log on to the master sudo salt and then configure everything from salt hmm <sighs> Let's see whether I mean it could be that they've added something since I last looked. Uh, so vagrant orchestrate. Uh, plugin. Ooh, I like it. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so this will have orchestrated deployment to already provisioned servers on top of. Oh, hang on a minute. Wait a second. Okay, so what does this do? Uh, okay, so uh, interesting. Okay, so It uses SSH basically. Oh, I see. Okay, so well, it begs the question: Why, why bother with this? Why not just do them by default? Hmm. It, what it seems to be doing is. Essentially, what I've just suggested, and that is for each of the servers, it's it's acting just as an SSH, and it run, it runs the shell instance using SSH. Uh, okay, so I don't see that there's a major advantage there. Um, Yeah, okay. Uh, no, there's no there's no advantage to those. Uh, you know, we might you might we, we might as well do it all uh, manually. Uh, so what I really want to do then is I want to uh, on my master either create the master last and accept all of the minions which is doable uh, that's, that, to be honest this is that's probably the simplest thing yeah 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 that's the simplest thing Let's do, let's do that. Yeah, let's do it that way. Okay, so, so what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that the salt master is the last thing created. And as part of its creation, it's going to wait for its own minion to connect, connect, contact it, but it's also going to have a list of other minions. And it'll effectively, uh, it'll effectively do this, uh, looping over each minion ID that it should have explicitly accepting them into uh, into the master yeah, so as long as the master is created last uh, th this will all work just fine yeah? so each of the minions will be left hanging as it were until the master comes online uh, at which point it will send it its key this also gives us a way of checking that all of our mass. Oh, yeah, this is much easier. 
Yeah, that's the that's the sensible way to do it. Because then once everything is being accepted and everything's up and running, we can just use salt then to revision the entire system. Okay, and salt does have orchestration. Cool. Okay. So uh, so the only thing we're going to do then is take those lines out. Um, well, these only make sense on um, right. Okay, so I'm going to do some renaming. Let's just get out of here for a second. So I'm going to do some renaming. I'm going to go into the provisions and I'm going to make a directory called master and another one called minion. Okay, so anything that only runs on the master, uh, I will copy into master and anything that runs on the master or the minion hmm. do I... okay so i'll move the server bootstrap to be part of common and we'll just call it bootstrap. Actually, why not just uh, call common server. And then I can move server bootstrap to be server slash bootstrap. Okay. I like it. Okay. And then... I can take server bootstrap and I can take those last few lines there and I can put those into master accept minions. Eee. And oh, while well, we're here, uh, we might as well This is actually going to end up with. Um, shall we make sure? We'll, we'll, just, we'll, we'll just call it the, the list of minions, right? We? So, um, do we just have. We'll just do it for each arg. Um, so. Um, And once again, uh, 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 it looks like dollar at will be what I want. Uh, 
It will do for what I want, I think. So, right. where am I? Right, so I think what I want to do is uh, ah, let's be let's be neat and tidy. Uh, minions. Okay. Um, this now becomes Self scripts first one. Except minions.
This will just make sure that I've not made any monumentally stupid mistakes. Yeah. That seems okay. So now, uh, it's a question of trying it end to end. Mm. So that it seems to be stuck. Not quite sure why that would cause it to stick. However, it's going to kick his ass and um, Right. Rebuild the whole thing just to make sure that we're not doing something stupid, and then uh, we can start thinking about just adding all of the other servers, which now is only one, admittedly, uh, to the beginning. Uh, then we can revisit this and say, Well, okay, uh, the other thing we want to do on the raster is once all of the minions have been accepted is we want to run salt to do the update now i've got to point out that <laughs> this may seem like a, a long way to way of doing it because vagrant can actually use salt uh, directly to provide the vagrant configuration but that's not what we're trying to do um, what we're trying to do is we're not just trying to create we're trying to use vagrants provisioning as little as we can uh, and rely on salt because when we come to read build the real servers that our vagrant system is currently simulating uh, we want our salt configuration to essentially work one-to-one -one. so we will be able to just create the physical servers or the cloud servers whatever okay and use them in exactly the same way uh, so this is all about developing and testing the configuration of the real servers so the the lighter touch we can have on using vagrant itself when creating these machines uh, they can create the virtual machine everything else we want the scripts to be transferable so that we can use them on a real physical system at the moment i think we've got that okay we've got um, uh, two scripts we've got one all it really does is 
allows us to pass through so it will install uh, the correct salt configure uh, salt components right? uh, the second script we've got just loops through and does um, a salt key acceptance which is exactly what we would do on the real system every time a new physical box became available we would remotely we would install uh, the salt using the bootstrap script okay then we would go on to our salt master we would check to see if the key was there we would accept that key uh, and then we would run the salt configuration uh, which is exactly what we're going to do now so again this whole exercise uh, if all we wanted to do was set up you know, a vagrant a set of vagrant machines I wouldn't go to all this trouble you know, I, I would just either use vagrant straight away and a load of shell scripts and just get the system set up or I would use salt directly and just use salt to provision the vagrant boxes and that would be fine um, but when you use salt as the provisioner on uh, with vagrant you're effectively using salt SSH so it's just producing a whole load of uh, Python scripts to be delivered on the machine run remotely using an SSH command and then uh, and that's it really so uh, we are yeah uh, we're really about testing our infrastructure scripts comfortable there I think Kenny's a bit sad I think despite the fact that he was quite happy running around he, he suddenly I think he must have realized he was uh, not at home anymore so when I found him he was very pleased to see me unfortunately I've been outside working uh, in the garden on a project that Kenny can't be around for because uh, most of the time I'm happy to put up with him interrupting me but this was um, a load of concreting that I've, I could not do with a dog around so he's been indoors and of course that makes him sad as well <laughs> uh, anyway you're a happy little dog at the moment aren't you? Boom. Okay, it looks to me like that's working exactly as I expected. Okay, so we've got our uh, keys coming in and being accepted, uh, which must mean that the minion was started and installed correctly and the master was inside and installed correctly. Uh, so the only thing really now is was the host name started? We can see that the uh, the minion name must have been accepted, uh, created correctly because we've got the minion certificate. To be perfectly honest, that looks pretty good to me. Okay, so now we can break an SSH onto the box. Uh, we can see that the host name has changed uh, and oops. we've got an FQDN there, which is correct. Uh, we've got an additional port, which is actually something provided by. Uh, uh, so if we now do uh, sudo and we do salt oops, star test dot ping, and there it is. So we can see our minion is running, 
and we're fine and funky. That's the only one we've got at the moment. Perfect. Okay, so that's a result. So now, if we look at the vagrant, oh. Okay, so that uh, is all to do with our our master. Okay, so everything from there down uh, is really, well, I say there down, I mean that config uh, uh, is not really specific. Okay, but it, the, all of that is specific to the master. So in here, we can insert, whoops, uh, we can insert all of uh, uh, all of the uh, minions, okay? Because we know that they're going to be created in the order in, the, in here. Okay, so we can create the minion, 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 minion. They're all going to try and contact a salt machine, which doesn't exist. Um, but that doesn't matter. Now, the other thing we've got to do is... Uh, we've got to edit that provisioner. Uh, no, uh, the, the server bootstrap provisioner. Because uh, you'll notice that it is setting up uh, the etc. It's it's always setting this to be. Uh, Uh, where, where is it? Uh, yeah, it's always setting this up to be the local host, All right? And we don't want that. We want it to be uh, on the line which has got the one nine two one six eight. So it's it's got to have the master IP address, All right? So. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll make that parameter uh, four, and we'll make master IP equal to dollar uh, three. Yeah, so we're going to add another value in, uh, and that will be uh, oops, uh, on this line. Okay, and and it will be one nine two dot one six eight. We'll, we'll, we'll parameterize this shortly. Okay, uh, so that's the IP address we want to give it into this master IP. And then we want the line. Uh, now we can't just Okay, we can't use this really simplistic way of doing it now. Okay, we've got to be a bit cleverer. So what we have to do is we have to actually run uh, something similar to what, if you remember, uh, we, we've done this sort of thing before. Where we want a line which contains the IP address and salt. If we find it, we don't do anything. If we don't find it, then we need to add it. But there's an interesting wrinkle. And that is, if we find a line with the IP address but not salt, we want to add salt as a host name on the end. Uh, if we find a line with the IP address Oh, sorry, if we don't find any line with the IP address at all, we want to add the IP address and salt. Uh, now, that raises interesting problems. Um, Now, how are we going to do this? Um, so, 
So the naive way of doing it is to change that so that it reads master IP. Okay, now the reason why this won't work is this every time this is wrong. Uh, in actual fact, it, it applies to the other one as well, and that is uh, every time this every time this provisioner is run, it's going to end up adding uh, salt uh, onto that line, and it, that's true of the localhost version as well, actually. Uh, so if we find localhost, we're going to end up inserting localhost salt every time. Uh, so we want to be a bit cleverer than that. So what we want to say is uh, run the first oops run the first command uh, uh, and the first command says if you find uh, any line which has got the word salt on it uh, then quit. and that will protect it otherwise if you find a line which has got master IP on it So if you find a line with salt on it, we're going to quit. So we know if we find a line with master IP on it, uh, then we can just append salt. Oh, blimey. Why this has suddenly become super laggy? Uh, I think that's the way it works. It's said. Oh, my set just sucks big time. Um, okay, so if I go to go to um, uh, to the end of the file I don't want to do that but, well actually if I don't find no, if I do find the master IP uh, then I will want to append salt if I don't find it uh, so I want to append salt and quit uh, so do I need a space in there Okay, failing that, if I find the master IP, then I want to append the salt to the end of that line. I think that works. Otherwise, I want to. Uh, Regardless, I want to append master 
It also means I can get rid of that grip, can't I? Because we're doing that with the first rule. Is that going to do what I want? Okay, let's try it. I got minus E. What? I thought that was. Uh, minus E. That's bad. Not okay. I'm a bit mystified. Why? Give me that third one for a second.
Okay, so A depends a line. Okay, so uh, I don't want to append a line, do I? So A is the wrong command for this. Uh, I want to append uh, I don't want to do it. No, 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 no. What I want to do is if I've got to here, then I want to append dollar master IP Okay, cool. Right, so that's doing what I wanted. Albeit, uh, okay, that's doing exactly what I wanted. Uh, albeit not very well. Right, okay, so now right, so you can do substitute. Ah, ampersand. Hmm. So we can do substitute at the end of every line. No. About a suffix at the end of every line. Well, I mean, that does the job. And the problem is, it's not exactly wired in mind. Now that would do the job.
I think we can do something like this. Uh, right, so you match master IP. In which case, we don't substitute the whole line and we're going to substitute it such that we add salt on the end. Dun, dun, dun. That's interesting. Oh, <laughs> okay. Ah, now then. So, as soon as we find the line with salt, we're quitting, which means the file will get truncated. Ah. So we don't really want to do that, do we? Because if we do that, Okay, if I do blah 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 Okay Yeah So we don't want to quit What we want to do is just Skip the line maybe um, is, it, is it just N To go to the next line No. Oh, that was just me being stupid. No, oh, now I've got it twice. And the reason for that is we skip to the end, and then of course it's carried on. And we've got so okay. So how do I consume the rest of the file? Uh, now I know there's a way of doing this. You're slipping off, mate. Okay, so mm. no.
Ooh, okay, but these are all these are all very simple cases that unfortunately Okay, let's let's think about this again, shall we? Uh, so we've got I mean that kind of almost works, but the problem is we are always uh, it's it's going to do that, and then it's going to do that. Uh, and that is going to always do the append. And we don't want to do that, do we? In fact, we don't even want to append salt whenever we find master. We don't want to append salt when we find master. I think. Okay, so if, we, if we've got through the whole file and we've got to the end, then we append the master IP and sort. Um, oh, Kenny, you're not helping. Okay, so. Uh, come on, mate. Give me a break. Okay, so. Okay, so that is matching that. Then it's matching that. Then it's matching the end of the file. So what I want to do is, once you've done your job, move on, dude. We only want to we only want to do that final append. I'm mean, to think that orc would be a better would be a better thing for this. Mm. Uh, okay, uh, when in doubt, uh, okay, so. I'm thinking that what I need to do is okay. So how do I specify? Oh, Kenny, no. What I need to do is specify a label and then just. So next is the correct way of doing it. Uh, branch to the colon function with the specified label. If any substitution has been made since the most recent reading, 
Okay, so. Okay, so we go to. Uh, okay, so what this needs to do is it needs to, if it matches salt, then I should be able to say that. Right, that's the label X. Go to next and branch to next. No, branch to X. Ah. What? Doesn't want any addresses. Do box space in uh, which makes sense because otherwise how do you distinguish between the label and the command so we need that, that. Hmm, okay maybe not Uh, let's call that a loop and then we branch back to loop. Ah, you bastard. Uh, expression 1, character 8, does not want any addresses. 2, 4, 6, 8, well, that's the colon. Mm. Uh, mm, B has to have a space, does it? Uh, how about this? Okay, so that's eight, nine, ten. Now, now we've got extra characters. What? Next. And then B loop. Oh, uh, I suppose. Oops. Uh. Oh, Kenny, you really are getting on my tits, boy. Nope. The developers have said. Make your error messages a bit more bloody sensible. So that's two, four, six, seven, that's eight, nine, ten, eleven. Extra characters after command. What the fuck? Okay. You're gonna have to get down, mate. Thank you. 
Okay, two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. What am I doing wrong now? Oh. Okay, uh, I don't understand. I mean, that's exactly what we've done here, isn't it? When you match step, you go into this loop, where you go next branch to loop. How is that not? I'm sure, okay, there's a space in there. And we don't have a command before the loop, but why would that be an issue? Let's put some new lines in there. So we match that. Set minus i minus e salt slash home curly place uh oh, uh space colon loop n branch loop 
close that, close the quotes, TST file. And that's fine. Really? It needs those return characters in there? Ah, it's fucked up, dude. Okay, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, we do. Uh, I'm going to race. Uh, come on, loop. Return N. Branch back to loop. Close down the brace. Just seems weird. Mm -hmm. Test set. Mm -hmm. being a dick. Oh, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, okay. No, fine. Uh, Good. Uh, I, was, I was expecting to have that line added to the end. So why isn't it getting to that last one? I suppose. Uh, I don't really need all of these, do I? Because uh, I can now
This should be simple, Penny. Right, okay, we'll take a break. Let the brain rest on you. Right, let's put this away for a while. Okay, well, I'll be back streaming again and we'll try and sort that out.